Welcome back, everyone. If you're new or visiting our church family today, my name is Aaron. I have the incredible privilege of being the pastor here. For those of you that are joining us online, we love you. We miss you wherever you're at. We hope you're having a great day and look forward to you being back with us. One of the things we've realized for those of us that have been back physically uh, worshiping together is online is an incredible tool that God has given us, but it is not a substitution for what church was created and intended to be. And anyone that's come back after being away for a long period of time, which last year brought a lot of people away, uh, anyone that's been back has said over and over and over, the overwhelming thing I hear from people is, I, I, I forgot how different it was. The message was the same online, but being in the room, being with other believers, I forgot how important and meaningful that was. And so we're, we're glad to be able to worship again together. We're rebuilding. Uh, every church in America right now is rebuilding after what uh, happened last year. And that's why we're doing the book of Ephesians, because Ephesians is the blueprint for what church is supposed to look like and what church is supposed to be. So if you've got a Bible, I want to encourage you to grab that and hold it uh, with me for just a moment. I hope you have your journal today to take some notes. It's going to be very, very practical today on what the church looks like and what the church is called to be and what God expects out of each and every one of us. But if you have a Bible, we're going to be studying God's Word today. Let's declare the truth of this Word over our life today. This has become tradition, at least during the Ephesians series. So hold it up with me and let's say this together. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Holy Spirit, teach me God's Word today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let, let me start by asking you a pretty challenging question. Uh, a lot of kids on schoolyards across America ask this of, of friends from time to time, and, and Paul asked this of us today, and it is a bit challenging. Uh, I'm going to try to sugarcoat it or spiritualize it a little bit for you, but it's a challenging question, and it is, are you a spiritual baby? Like, are you a baby? Uh, it, you know, are you living like a baby? Now, we know the Bible says we're supposed to have childlike faith. That's different. Childlike faith is different than baby faith. We're not supposed to have baby faith. We're supposed to have childlike faith. Children naturally trust, naturally have faith. My four-year-old, he has faith every day when he asks me for breakfast that I'm going to provide breakfast for him. He never asks me wondering. He never asks me in fear. He never has any anxiety or doubt when he asks me for breakfast. He is fully assured when he comes to me and says, Dad, I'm hungry. Can you feed me some breakfast? He has full faith that he's going to receive breakfast from me. So I'm not talking about childlike faith. I'm asking you the question today that all of us need to ask of ourselves is, am I a spiritual baby? Am I a baby? Because Paul's going to hit us pretty hard today on what it looks like to be a spiritual baby, what it looks like to be spiritually immature, and what God expects out of our growth as followers of Christ. So we're going to go back to verse 11 and, and go to verse 16 today. So we're going to go back a couple verses, and then we're going to pick up a few more verses. Verse 11 of chapter 4. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ, that's the church, that's what God has put us into, may be built up. So God's desire is for you to be planted in a church where you can be built up. And he's put all these people in the church to serve one another, works of service, so that all of us can be strengthened and grow to everything God expects out of us. Verse 13, until we all reach unity, that's the goal. That's what we looked at last week. Unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be babies, we'll no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by waves and blown here and there by every kind of wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is 
Christ, from him the whole body, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. As each part, as each part. It's talking about you today. If you are a part, if you've been attending our church for any period of time, Paul is talking to you. Each part has work to do. Last week, we looked at the question, what would it look like to be a part of a great church? And then how do we make coastline? If this is the church that God has planted us in, all of us are part of the big C, capital C, church. That's every Christian on planet earth. Every Christian at every church all across this globe are part of the big C church. But God puts each of us individually into the little C local church, a family, a community, a body where we can be attached together through ligaments. We can have the lifeblood flowing through us, which is love, so that each of us can find our part to play, because all of us have a part to play, and do the work that God created each one of us to do. And we began last week looking at this by looking at what makes a great church, and it's one word, unity. When we are unified behind the purpose that God has given us, and unity is not uniformity. Unity doesn't mean we all look alike, dress alike, act alike, In our light, unity is we are all unified behind one purpose, but each of us bring a different part. We have an individuality to the purpose that God has called us to, and we're going to continue on with that today. Look at this theme called teamwork. Paul talks about a teamwork that is necessary to build a great church. Now, if you're from the business world, which many of you are, you know over the last 10 years, teamwork has become a huge buzzword in the business community. There's a lot of blogs, there's a lot of seminars, there's a lot of books, there's a lot of leadership understanding about teamwork. And it's interesting to compare everything that's being taught in the success culture and the business culture about teamwork to what the Bible says about the unity of the church and how God expects us to work together as a team to accomplish God's mission here on earth earth. So it's interesting to look at what the world is saying about this concept of teamwork. I read a psychology blog this week, and here's what the blog said about teamwork. It said, teams can withstand much more stress than individuals because a team reproduces a family structure. So as a team, you can handle a lot more stress and a lot more anxiety in life than you can handle individually. Because a team creates a family structure. It goes on to say the sense of belonging coupled with the additional energy that a team provides for each other results in more excitement, enthusiasm, and results. Now, it almost sounds like they're talking about the church. But they're not talking about the church. This is a secular perspective of how teams work. Now, where do these people get this truth or this understanding about teamwork? Why is the business world switching from a more dominant style of leadership to a more team-based style of leadership? One reason and one reason alone, the bottom line. They've simply understood they're, they're more successful. It moves the bottom line further. It works. Now, why does it work is the real question. The reason it works is because it's a biblical principle. You see, everything you see in the success world, everything you see in the business world, everything that you read about in these leadership books, in these business books, in these success books, every one of the working principles you see is rooted in Scripture. It's rooted in the Bible. The Bible is the greatest book on leadership, on business, on success. Then it, and everything the business world uses for leadership and success is absolutely rooted as a biblical principle. And today we're going to look at what God says, what Paul says about the church and how God expects us to work together as a team. And teamwork in the church can never compare to teamwork in the business world. I know it's rewarding to be on a team, to accomplish something, to move the needle, to to see the bottom line, to see the return, the results, but it'll never do anything compared to what teamwork in the church 
can accomplish. And here's why. The teamwork in the church is a sense of family for all of eternity. One of the things you've heard me say a lot around here is for those of you that serve on the Go team on a regular basis, I love to talk to Go team uh, people and leaders and people serving in different positions, and I always ask them, what did you do this week? Like, like honestly, if you think about this last week, everything you did this last week, what did you do that, th this week that is really going to matter a million years from today? Think about that for a moment. What did you do at work this week? What did you do at school this week? What did you do at home, in your family, in your neighborhood this week that really will matter, that absolutely will matter a million, five million, ten million years from today? Chances are not much. Some of you may have an opportunity to do something that may last a year, that may last a few years, that may even last your lifetime. Some of you may be so lucky that you get to live a life that actually lives a couple generations beyond you where, where two generations from now, they'll remember your name. Maybe it's on a building somewhere and, and they say the name of the building on a regular basis, but over time you will be forgotten and your work will be forgotten and what you did will be forgotten. The only thing that lasts forever is what we do as a team through the church. You see, every weekend at Coastline, when somebody makes a decision to follow Jesus, it doesn't matter where you serve. It doesn't matter if you're making coffee or you're serving in the parking lot or you're helping with children or you're on the media team or the worship team. It doesn't matter at all. You're part of a team that did something that's actually going to matter 10 million years from today. You were part of making an eternal difference. And so, yeah, being a part of a team is very rewarding and very fulfilling, but being a part of a team that's making an eternal difference, being a part of a team that's accomplishing something that's going to actually matter millions of years from today cannot be compared with being a part of any other team in life. So we want to remember this. And I love that phrase, as each part does its work, because we all have a part and we all have work to do. Peter puts it like this in 1 Peter 4.10, each of you, every one of you, should use whatever gift you have received. Do you realize you've received a gift? Because of God's grace and God's mercy, he has gifted you with something. He has, he has given you the ability to do something better than anyone else. You have a place to play on the team. There is something that you have inside of you where you can contribute a gift and each of us should use that gift, not just for our own selfish game, not just to advance our business or career, but we use that gift to serve others. Why? Because we are faithful stewards of God's grace in all of its various forms. And so because of God's grace, he has entrusted me with gifts in my life. And so I'm going to use those gifts to serve others because I want to be a faithful steward of the gifts that we have. And so let's look at the goal of today. It's verse 13. This, this is the goal of the church. This is what God expects out of our journey, out of our team together. He says, until we all reach unity, unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, God's direction and God's plan for our team. The first part is we all reach unity. It doesn't say we reach toward unity. It says we reach unity. We actually arrive there. It's when Jesus comes back, but when Jesus comes back, he will complete all things. It goes on to say, until we all become mature, not becoming mature, but we become mature. There is a point where we will all become mature mature, where God is going to finish the work that he began inside of each and every one of us. And then it says, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now, that's the key right there that I want you to hold on to. The whole measure of the fullness of Christ. What is the fullness of Christ? What is the fullness of Christ? The full measure of the fullness of Christ. What does that mean? Well, let's go back to Ephesians 1. For those of you with us a few weeks ago, Paul answers that question, and he builds the entire letter out of this passage. This is, this is the point of everything he's writing. He says in Ephesians 1, verse 22, God placed all things under his feet, 
The whole goal of what God is doing throughout all of history is coming to this point. God's going to take everything in all of history and all of time, everything that exists, and he's going to place it under his feet, and he appointed him to be head over everything for the church. So Christ is the head of everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills everything in every way. So here's the question. What is the fullness of Christ? The church. That's why this is significant. That's why finding your part to play is critical to your spiritual growth, to your maturity, to you no longer staying a baby because we are the fullness. We're going to attain the measure of fullness. That fullness is the church, his body, that we are privileged to get to build, to be a team in. And so what Paul does at the end of this section is he, he's talking about the church. He gives us two pictures. He gives us the picture of an immature church or an immature Christian, and then he gives us a picture of a mature church or a mature Christian, and it's kind of like a measuring stick because it's a process. Christian growth is the process of moving from spiritual infancy to spiritual maturity. Nobody becomes a full-grown, mature Christian the day they're born again. It is a journey. We, we become mature over time. Now, it is true. If you look at babies naturally, when you have a baby, an infant grows faster than any other time in your life. Think about how quickly an infant grows in a very short period of time, how many pounds they add daily, how many inches they grow daily. If we grew at the same rate that babies grew the first two to three years of their life, we would be giants if we kept growing at that rate. So it is true that when you're born again, you grow pretty quickly, pretty fast. People get very on fire for God. They grow quickly, but that doesn't mean they mature quickly. They may have a lot of passion, but not a lot of maturity. So what we have to do is go on a growth journey to maturity. And the picture that I like to use is a bridge. You know, we begin as spiritual babies, we begin as infants, and our goal is maturity. And in between, there is a bridge called next steps. We talk a lot about next steps as a church. And here's the truth. I have a next step. You have a next step. Every one of us has a next step. None of us have arrived at maturity yet. We are all in process. We are all on a journey going across this bridge, taking next steps. Your next step may be to lead a group. You've attended groups for years, and you love being a part of groups, and God is calling you now to lead a group and care for others. Maybe your, your, your next step is to be a part of a go team, to find your part and do the work you were created to do. Maybe it's to lead a go team. Maybe it's water baptism. Every one of us in this room have a next step in our spiritual journey. What is your next step? Have you identified it? And then he gives us a measuring stick of what it looks like to be an infant, what it looks like to be mature. Before we look into the actual signs, let me just give you a checkup. This, this is kind of an exam. It's between you and God. But just ask yourself these questions because it'll help you identify where you're at on the bridge. Like, like, like you're somewhere on that bridge between infancy and maturity, and you got to begin to identify where you're at on the bridge so that you can begin to identify next steps in the journey. So let me ask you a series of questions. First off, am I consumed by possessions or am I content with possessions? Do I always want more? Am I never satisfied? Like, I got to get that new purse. I got to get that new car. I got to get that new toy. I've got to get that, you know, or are you, have you learned to be content? Or are you always wanting more because you never feel like you have enough? Let me ask you this question. Am I selfish in my relationships or am I sacrificing in my relationships? Do I use people to serve me or do I use my gifts to serve people? Here's a big one in our culture today. Is it my body is my business or is it my body is his temple? Because I've been bought with a price and I don't belong to myself. I'm God's and he gets to decide, not me. Am I a spiritual baby or am I spiritually mature? 
Is it work expresses my worth? So I need to achieve, I need to make money, I need to climb the, the ladder so that I feel important, I feel good about myself, or is it work expresses my worship? God's given me talents and abilities, and I work hard to honor my creator. I don't work hard for my self-esteem. I already have self-esteem because who I am in Christ. Problems are destroying me, they're, they're, they're crippling me, they're crushing me, or problems are developing me. How do you look at it? Are you growing through the challenges of life, or are they killing you? I seldom handle the Bible. I mean, I may read it every once in a while, but I don't meditate, I don't study, I don't dig deep, or do I accurately handle the Bible? My time is spent wastefully, I just kind of live my life, and whatever happens, happens, or my time is spent wisely, I make the most of every day. Now, here's the truth. I'm not all the way on the mature side of any one of those things, but I'm happy to report I'm further down the bridge than I was last week, and I hope next week I'm a little bit further down the bridge than I am today. I am in process. I am taking next steps just like you. Spiritual growth is a journey, and let me just help you understand. We all start at different points. So don't ever fall into comparison, trying to compare yourself with other people. There are other people who look more spiritual just because they grew up in a family that was more disciplined or more obedient or more moral. It's not because they love God more. It's just that's who they were before they were Christians. So don't compare yourself to other people. God, God's simply looking at where did you start the journey and are you taking steps? So let me give you the picture of an immature church or an immature Christian. Paul gives us three signs of immaturity. The first is circumstances. Circumstances. One of these is going to control you. When you're immature, you're controlled by these things. Circumstances. The way Paul puts it is you're tossed back and forth by the waves. So you don't have stability. You don't have solid footing. Every time life throws you a curveball, you're tossed back and forth. The circumstances of life determine how you feel, determine how you react. It's not your faith, it's fear, it's foolishness, it's circumstances that moves you. And, and this is dangerous. This is what we're seeing in America right now. Circumstances. That, that's why last year was so disheartening for me as a pastor, not by the way the world reacted. The world's going to react like the world, but by how many Christians participated in the way the world reacted to things. That's not like us. Circumstances, you know, I was a Christian before the pandemic, and I'm a Christian during the pandemic, and I'm going to be a Christian after the pandemic. The pandemic should not affect my Christianity. It should not affect my faith. It should not affect my prayer life. You see, when you're spiritually immature, you're controlled by circumstances. They, they toss you around here and there. And what do you do? Well, the, the, hard, the, the hard advice that Paul gives us is you need to grow up. How do we grow up? Being in community, being a part of the church, getting grounded. And again, what the pandemic did was try to isolate you, try to get you out of community, try to get, because Satan knows if he gets you out of community, if he isolates you, you're going to fall apart. You're not going to mature. You're going to go back to infancy if you get isolated. And that's exactly what happened in America. People got isolated. They got what we called socially distanced, and they fell apart emotionally because God never created us to be socially distanced. He created us to be connected in community so that we can grow. Second thing Paul talks about that you'll be controlled by when you're spiritually immature is new ideas, or let me say seemingly new ideas because there's nothing new under the sun. He says this, they're blown here and there by every wind of teaching. Now, if you know anything about babies, babies are not discerning at all. They're not. If you give a baby healthy food, or you give a baby unhealthy food, or you give a baby poisonous food, they don't know how to discern. They, they don't know how to choose. A baby cannot choose between healthy food and poisonous food. Babies just eat whatever you give them. Paul says when you become a believer... You are a spiritual baby, which means you've got to be very, very careful. Because how do you know if you're eating healthy teaching, unhealthy teaching, or even poisonous teaching? 
Because this is what we're seeing right now in America. You look at the generation of Christians we're living in right now. We are the most biblically illiterate generation of Christians, I think, in the history of the world. You ask the average Christian in America what they believe on sexuality, what they believe on life, what they believe on the reality of hell or the reality of the devil. It is shocking to see people catch by, caught by the wind, blown here and there, all over, so far from what the Bible... The Bible's not silent about any of this stuff, by the way. But the problem is when you're a spiritually baby, somebody comes along and and, and they tickle your emotions. They tickle your emotions and say, well, that's not really what the Bible says. Let, let, me, let me show you another, another idea about that. And that's what Paul is talking about here. They're blown by the wind. They're not grounded in the Word. And so they believe all sorts of crazy things that are so far away from Scripture. See, Jesus described his teaching as a rock. Something you can build your life on. Something that you could stand upon. Paul describes false teaching as a wind. It blows in and blows out. There's nothing solid to it. And then finally, the third thing that will control you if you're spiritually mature, and probably the most dangerous, is selfishness. Babies are the most selfish human beings alive. If you've ever been around an infant, there is not a more self-centered, selfish creature than a newborn baby. It is all about them. How many of you understand what I'm saying? They don't care about anybody in the house. They have no empathy. They don't care how hard your day was or how hard you worked to provide for them. They could care less. All they want is to be fed, to be held, to be changed. I mean, it is 100% all about them. They're very, very selfish. You were very, very selfish when you were born. That's just the reality of it. And Paul says when you are born again, you're born as a baby, which means you can be very, very selfish. And when you're selfish, you can fall into all sorts of deceitfulness. So he goes on to say, by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. They're deceitfully scheming out of selfishness. I think this is why, if you go back to verse 2, we looked at this last week, Paul has to remind them, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Why? Because you're spiritual babies and you have to learn those things. I'm having to teach my four-year-old to be humble, to be gentle, to be patient, because he's been an infant for so long that now that he's growing up, he has to learn those things because their first part of his life was completely self-centered. And all of us will fall victim to our own selfishness, and we will fall victim to the selfishness of others if we don't spiritually mature. That's why Christians can be very gullible. Christians can, can trust somebody with selfish motives because, well, I thought we're supposed to trust as Christians. No, we're supposed to get spiritually mature because what can happen is you can be taken advantage of by somebody who has selfish and ulterior motives to take you down the wrong path. And do you know who the most deceitful person is in your world? Do you know the person that will deceive you more than anyone else? It's yourself. It's yourself. Your own selfishness will deceive yourself. That's why Jeremiah says the heart is deceitful above all things. The heart. As a pastor, you can't even imagine how many times I've heard people use the most incredible justifications for things that are clearly unbiblical. And they have totally deceived themselves for their own selfishness. They've de they, they, they're doing what they want to do and coming up with the craziest justifications because they have deceived themselves. And see, this is the danger of not growing up spiritually. The danger of being spiritually immature is your control. Your control. Now let's talk a little bit about the picture of a mature Christian, the picture of a mature church. Because here's the thing. Mature churches, mature Christians, they give control of their life to Christ. And there are three main areas they give Christ total control of. Now, I want you to notice something very, very important here. We are either controlled by circumstances and other people in our life, or we are controlled by Christ. We, we submit to him. We give control to him. Now, what does that mean? And this is huge. Everyone in here needs to at least, if you don't get anything else today, take this statement home with you. We do not control our own destiny, but we do get to decide who does. 
You do not get to control your own destiny, but you do get to decide who does. So you either give control of your destiny to Christ and give him total control, or by default, you give control to circumstances. You give control to deceitful people. You give control to selfishness. But you don't have control of your own destiny. I know that's not what Back to the Future says. The future is whatever you make it, so make it a good one. Great movie, but it's a wrong philosophy. It doesn't work that way. We don't get to decide our future. We get to decide who does. And it's either going to be circumstances, which I'm telling you, you don't want to go that route, or it's going to be Christ. It's, it's the kingdom of upside downs. I don't know if you've understood this about Christianity yet, but the kingdom of God is all upside down. You know, the Bible says, if you want more, give away. Well, that doesn't make any sense. If I give what I have away, I'm going to have less. No, the Bible says you're going to have more. Well, if you want to be first, you've got to be last. Well, that doesn't make any sense. If I want to be first, I need to be first. If I'm last, I'm not first. No, the Bible says if you want to be first, you've got to be last, because the last will be first. This is another part of the kingdom of upside downs. If you want freedom, give control to Christ. Well, if I give control to Christ, I don't have freedom. I'm, I'm under his, you know, I become his subject. No, the truth is when you give control to the right person, you actually experience true freedom. And that's the beauty of giving him control. So mature people, mature Christians, three signs that Paul shows us here. First is it's in their communication. It's how we talk. This is, this is a sign of maturity, how you talk. How you talk, your communication. One of the signs of maturity is the words that you use. Unfortunately, you see a lot of churches that are filled with gossipers. That's spiritual immaturity. You see other people who are filled with with big, super spiritual, hyper spiritual language. Ever met someone who, who they're just every, it's like so super spiritual, you don't understand what they're saying? That kind of annoys me because they're, they're acting like this super mature person, but really all they are is a bloated Christian. The problem today is we are way overeducated beyond our level of obedience. There's a lot of people who know all the right words, but they don't live it out. In other words, it's not, it's not getting the lingo right. It's the maturity of your heart and of your life. So, so we have to understand that words are powerful. Proverbs puts it like this, the tongue has the power of life and death. Your mouth has incredible force. You're either speaking blessing and life or you're speaking cursing and death. And you get to decide, but there are no neutral words. And so here's what Paul says about maturity. Instead, speaking the truth in love. The habit of a mature church the habit of a mature Christian is someone who has the ability to speak the truth in love. See, the problem is we have people who speak truth without love, or we have people who don't speak anything because of love. So I'm not going to warn you that you're driving your life over a cliff because I love you and I don't want to offend you. Or I'm all about the truth and I have no love and I just offend people anyways and turn them off and no one gets help. You see, maturity is being able to share truth with people but covered with so much love, they receive it. That only happens in community, by the way. That's why Paul is pulling us into a church. He's saying, in church, in community, in relationship, you will position yourself where people can, because I have blind spots, you have blind spots. I just need someone that can point out my blind spots with a lot of love, because if you try to point my blind spots out with no love and no relationship, I'm going to reject you and not hear you. And we're all that way. If I don't have a relationship with you, if you don't know that I love you with all my heart and I come across abrasive, I can give you the greatest truth in the world that would absolutely save your life, but you're still going to drive over a cliff because there's no love. Now, how do we do this? Because it's almost impossible to get this right. Look at the cross. It's all about the cross. The cross, by the way, is the answer to everything. Every problem, every dilemma, every challenge you will ever face, look at the cross and you'll find the answer. How, do, how does the cross help me speak truth and love? Well, the cross is the ultimate truth in love. The cross is the ultimate truth. What ultimate truth? I'm a sinner, and I deserve hell. I deserve to burn in hell forever because of my life. That's the truth of the cross, and it's insulting. It's abrasive. And I can't receive that truth unless I see the love in the cross that God was willing to go to a cross because of how much he cares about me. You see, the cross is the ultimate picture of truth and love. The truth is insulting. It's offensive. I, I, I am so wicked and evil. 
See, a lot of us don't want to accept that. A lot of us didn't know we're bad, but very few people want to accept the fact that I am so wicked, I am so evil, that it took nothing less than the death of God's Son for me to be saved. But at the very same time, I'm so loved and accepted that God was willing to give His Son for me. You see, the cross is the ultimate picture of truth and love. And with the cross, I have the ability to speak truth and love. See, I can give somebody the truth without fear of losing a relationship because I know I'm accepted by God. And I can give them the truth covered with love because I know I'm a sinner in need of God myself. And so the cross softens me. It humbles me. It allows me to speak truth in love. Sign of a mature church. The second sign of a mature church is our direction, how we decide. You want to look for maturity? Look at the leader of the church. And by the way, I'm not the leader of the church. The Bible is very clear. Jesus is the head of the church, not me. The pastor is not the head of the church. Jesus is the head of the church. Again, look what it says. We will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. Christ gets to call the shots. And by the way, he did. It's our responsibility to see what he said. It's our responsibility to study because, he, again, he's not silent. He called the shots, and he is Lord. He is king, not us. We follow him. We submit to him. We surrender him. So it's not what we want. It's what Christ wants. And by the way, let me warn our generation, it's not what we think he wants, it's what he actually wants. Because I hear a lot of people say, well, you know, I hear this all the time from well-meaning Christians, well, Jesus just wants us to, and then, they, and then they say something that he never said. Because it feels right. Just because it feels right, just because it fits culture, just because it, it emotionally tickles you, doesn't mean it's what he actually said. So let's just make it clear. It's not what we think he said. It's what he actually said. And he, it's all written down for us. So it's not like we have to guess. We just get to study it. And if he's in charge, then we study his word and we follow him. And then finally, let me close with this, our service. The sign of spiritual maturity is how you work. It's how you work. Are you serving? The most spiritually mature people I've ever met are people who are deeply involved with the church and they serve and they work and they give of their time, they give of their talents, they give of themselves to other people. Always the most spiritually mature people. God never called us to attend. People who attend church are spiritual babies, according to Paul. Because it's very clear in this passage because he's talking about immaturity and maturity and he ends maturity with each person finds their part to do their work. That's how he ends it. So a sign of spiritual maturity is finding your part and doing the work that God has called you to do. Now, we do it through love. Love, again, is the lifeblood of how it works. Without love, our body is dead. It, 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 you know, without blood, your physical body is dead. Without love, our church is dead. So love is the blood that flows through our church. It's speaking truth in love. It's serving in love. It's all about love, but it's finding our part to play. I'm going to do my part. And that's what it means to be on a team. You know, Peter Drucker, one of the, the, the leadership guys, he talks about different teams. He talks about baseball teams, soccer teams, and, and jazz ensembles. You know, on a baseball team, everyone has to have individual talent and skill. And the team really doesn't need to relate to each other all that much because they all go out there and they do their own job. A soccer team is a little different. The soccer team actually has to work together to move the ball down the field. A jazz ensemble is a whole other level of team. They just have to look at each other, nod their head, and all of a sudden they're going to a different key, different note, and they're flying away somewhere else together as a team. Which of those pictures looks like the church? None of them. Because what Paul does is he gives us a picture of the church that is far more intense than those three. He says it's a body with Christ as the head. And all of us are a part to play. And here's the truth. If you don't find your part to play, our body is weak. Like think about my pinky. My, my pinky is, is not the most significant part in my body, but it's critically important. Because if I lose my pinky, my grip will never be as strong. My grip will never be as strong without my pinky. 
You may feel like, well, the church doesn't need me. No, we do need you because our grip will never be as strong without you. We will always be a little bit weaker without you finding your part to play. But as you find your part to play, as we all come together, we become the mature body that God has called us to be that can actually make an eternal difference in the community that God has placed us in. And so I'm going to end with this. Here's Jesus' encouragement to us. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. Your love for one another. That's teamwork. That's the church coming together, unified as a team, our love for one another, serving together, working together, each person doing their part. Can you imagine what can take place in this community if every one of us find our part to play? If every one of us gets, because we're all attached to somebody else in this body. I mean, think about it. My hand cannot be a part of my body if the arm decides it doesn't want to be a part of the body. Think about that for a moment. You may be like the arm and, and, and not doing your job. Do, do you know how many other people in the church you're impacting by not being the arm? Like none of the fingers are able to do its job. The hand's not able to do its job. The palm's not able to do its job. Why? Because the arm's not in place. Because the arm is what holds the hand to the body. We have to realize all of us have a place. We're all connected to each other. And when we find our place, the body becomes mature and we're able to make a massive difference in this community and show North County the picture of Jesus, the fullness of Jesus, his church. Would you close your eyes with me for a moment? Father, every one of us here today have a next step. And Lord, I know this message is very, very practical, but the truth is, as people embrace their part to play, they'll get more out of it than anyone else. Because it's exactly what you design for them to become mature. None of us become spiritually mature in classrooms, Father. We come mature as we work together, as we team together, as we unify under your purpose in this community, that's how we become mature. And so I pray that every person here will identify where they're at on the bridge, from being a spiritual baby to being spiritually mature, and they will see clearly what their next step is. Whether it's joining a GO team today, whether it's saying, listen, I, I want to do more. Can I can I be a leader on the go teams? Maybe it's groups. Maybe they want to lead a group because there's people in the church that they have a heart for. Think about the, the man I talked to last week who's a recovering alcoholic and he wants to build a group for people who want to get free of alcohol in their life. He's finding his part to play. And everyone here has a part to play. So God, let us each take a next step this week, whatever step that is. For some people, their next step may be giving their life to you. They're here today and they're not a Christian or they haven't made a decision to make you number one. And if, and if that's you, I want to take a moment in the middle of this prayer and ask you to say yes to Jesus. So if that's you, would you put your hands over your heart for just a moment? If you've never said yes to Jesus before, or Jesus is not number one right now in your life, and you want to make a decision to make him number one, just put your hands over your heart with me. And just in your heart right now, say, Jesus, today I invite you to be number one. I will follow you, and I will serve you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name. Now, everyone, look up for just a moment. If you prayed that with me today, would you tell somebody... Would you let somebody know you made a decision to follow Jesus? You made a decision to put him first. We'd love to pray with you. And then what we'll do is we'll, we'll help you identify some really good next steps to begin this journey. And every one of us have a next step. Would you stand with me? I want to invite you before we leave today, let's worship together. Let's take a moment today and give God the glory that is due his name. And as we walk out of here, let's walk out in just a, just a celebration of worship as we leave today.